Tsar Shalom Ministries launches in 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You're watching Star TV. You're watching Star TV. You're watching Star TV. Estás viendo Star TV. Torah portion for today is number 40, black. Black means waster, destroyer. After defeating, it starts with after defeating the men of Org, the giants. The Israelites were headed home to the promised land. This was an exciting time for them. It is as a Christian that draws near to the end of his road or pilgrimage, pilgrimage, finally headed home. Hallelujah, finally headed home. Can't wait to head home. Then they were, uh, the, the, the Israelites were up against trials and trouble. Israel wanted to pass through without any trouble, but Sihon, the Amorite king, wouldn't let them pass through their land. He started a fight and was defeated and it, in Numbers 21. The Israelite marched on towards to the land of Moab before entering the Promised Land. Sometimes, even though you go out of your way to live a peaceful life with people. You're forced to defend yourself. Try to defend yourself in a peaceful way. Try not to be quick to anger. And remember, Jesus died for that knucklehead. Honor our Lord's hard work of salvation and try to be kind. Black and his people were afraid of Israel. They numbered over 600,000 men, not including the Levites. Black, the son of Zippor. Zippor means a bird. He acted out of fear, just like Sihon. The, the news about Egypt wasn't a small thing. Probably They probably heard of the supernatural might of the Lord God and the Moabites made peace with the Midians. And in Genesis 36-35, these two people were long-time enemies but lacked hope to combine their forces and defeat Israel he also hired a soothsayer to curse them. Balak sent for Balaam. Balaam means the devourer of people or one not belonging to the people, like a foreigner, or a corrupter of the people. Balak reminds me of Satan at the temptation of our Lord Jesus the Christ. In the way he hired Balaam, saying, Yield to me, yield to me at once, for riches 
riches and honor are in my right hand. All these things I will give to thee if thou, thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now Balaam took the job and started to work cursing Israel. There is a measure of truth in putting a curse on people or places. It is, it is true men have had power to curse. In Joshua 6.26, when he cursed Jericho, it fell. And in 2 Kings 2.24, when the she-bears killed 42 children for mocking Elijah, he cursed them first. And in 2 Kings 6.10, when, when Elijah prayed to Abba to open the people's eyes, they were open. When natural resources can't be obtained, we may turn to the supernatural aid by prayer to Abba. The Lord God told him not to curse his people who he has blessed. There's another reference in Genesis 31, 24, how our Lord God came to Laban in a dream and told him not to talk bad or good against Jacob. In other words, God told him to be silent. Balaam didn't go to God and ask, Lord, what will thou have me to do? But our God came to Laban as to say, what are you doing? What men are these with thee? Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not go with them. The guests we entertain, the persons who visit us, the associations we enter into, the friendship we form, are all all known, all known to the, our Lord Jesus. In Proverbs 4, chapter 4, 14, and 19, tells reference to this. In verses 20, Balaam did not tell the Moabite dignitaries the whole truth. The, the dignitaries didn't tell Balak, the king, their king, the whole truth either. And Balaam got richer. When Balaam went a second time to God, permission was granted from Abba, and he said, Arise, go with them. But yet the words which I say do you do. And when man when man is determined to have his way, to have his own way, a time comes when Abba ceased to oppose him in the matter. In Psalms eighty one verse eleven and twelve refers to this now. Abba granted his request in anger. As in Numbers 11, 31, 30, and 33, when the Israelites wanted meat. They're all crying for meat. Abba gave them meat. And in his anger, gave them the plague. Balak offered more money. And Balaam got richer. Be careful of getting and enjoying the wealth of this world. For it will draw the heart away from God and godliness. Money and more money. The better we are at earning, saving, growing, and protecting our money, the chances are greater that we will have an a more comfortable lifestyle and have a significant impact on our families and the people we come into contact with every day. But it comes with a big price tag. The time and efforts we spend on earning money takes away it takes away from our lives 
takes away from our freedom to do what is important to us, whether that's traveling, finding new experiences, building a strong and loving relationship with our families and friends, doing good and charitable works, whatever it is that makes us closer to God and man, in my opinion, spending it on those things, rather spending it on stuff, is money well spent. No matter how little or how much you make, when you buy for memories and experience of joy and laughter, it lasts a lifetime. Now a donkey is called an ass. And a donkey is also called a jack. A mule is when a donkey mates with a horse. Balaam saddles his donkey and he, he's on a mission. Focus on the prize. His donkey sees it, the angel. His donkey sees an angel with a sword in his hand. And the voice tries to avoid the angel. First to one side, then another, pushing against a wall, crushing Balaam's foot. Then the animal falls under him. Balaam, being by, bl blinded by sin, couldn't see the spiritual thing. The obstruction only irritated and enraged him that he lost all self-control and took his frustration upon his animal. Because the spiritual eye of the lamb was blinded by his thirst for wealth and honor, Jehovah opened the mouth of the animal to show a seer by profession his own blindness. It wasn't until this humiliation experienced by Abba, hallelujah, that the lamb opened his eyes, that he realized that the angel of the Lord with a drawn sword standing in his road, ready to strike him dead, that he, he couldn't see the spiritual thing. Balaam yielded himself to the Lord, but there are a lot of folks in this world that even with an eye-opening experience like Balaam wouldn't yield themselves to the Lord. They just won't. I pray they do. There is much, so much more to this story, but I need to stop here and go on. The prophets, Micah, Five, chapter 5 through 6. There are so many commentaries in the studylight.org website that can be a help for anyone that want to dig deep in the word of Abba. In Micah chapter 6, 5, five and 6 tells how ungrateful God's people can be. A theologian named Dr. Cunning illustrates to Micah 6 as he says here if Adam needed to hear his father's voice surrounded in the fair garden of the unshaded glory of paradise surely much more does this prodigal world that has gone astray from him needs to hear a father's voice asking after us. And the first declaration of the father's desire that the loss may be found and the dead at length become alive. That was from Dr. Cunnings. The power of Balak and the device of Balaam were frustrated, and the curse was turned into a blessing. From Shittim to Galgil, their progress was safe and triumphant. Abba could have done no more 
for them. Yet they forgot God their Savior, who has done great things in Egypt, wondrous things in the land of Ham. In the review of our lives, we see goodness and mercy and abundant reasons for gratitude. Praise God. In deliverance from trouble and destructions of their enemy, of our enemy. In Psalms 107, verse 34, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wondrous works to the children of men. The Lord bless us. Thank you. Today we're going to learn about the famous abolitionist, Frederick Douglass. Although he was born a slave, Frederick Douglass later escaped to freedom and became famous around the world as a writer, speaker, and supporter of freedom for slaves and equal rights for everyone. He was born on a plantation in Maryland and named Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. Because he was born into slavery, he never knew his birthday. Slave records show he was born sometime in February of 1818. Frederick Douglass never knew his father and spent very little time with his mother. Instead, he was raised by his grandmother until he was six or seven, when he was old enough to begin work on the plantation. Two years later, he was sent to Baltimore to be a child's companion in the house of Mr. Hugh Auld. It was in Baltimore that young Frederick began to learn how to read. Mr. Auld's wife, Sophia, taught him the alphabet and how to make simple words. But when her husband found out what she was doing, he forced her to stop. He said that teaching a slave to read was illegal and unsafe that once a slave learned to read, he would never be satisfied with slavery and it would be impossible to keep him. When young Frederick heard those words, he suddenly realized that learning to read and write would be his pathway from slavery to freedom. Although he no longer had a teacher, he secretly taught himself to read and write by watching others, determined not to give up even though he was punished whenever he was caught. At about 15 years old, Frederick Douglass was sent from Baltimore back to the plantation, where he was forced to work for a cruel master who whipped and beat him frequently. One day when he was 16 years old, he fought back during a beating and won, and the man never beat him again. Soon after this, he was sent to work for another master, and there he made an attempt to escape to freedom. That attempt failed, and Frederick Douglass was sent back to Baltimore to work in a shipyard. In Baltimore, he made friends with free black men and women, including Anna Murray, who encouraged him to try to escape again. 
With ID papers borrowed from another friend, Frederick Douglass disguised himself as a free black sailor and took a train north to New York on September 3rd, 1838. Once safe in New York, he wrote to Anna Murray, who traveled north to be with him. They were married a few days later and settled in New Bedford, Massachusetts, where they changed their last name to Douglas to avoid being found by Frederick's old master. At 20 years old, Frederick Douglas was finally a free man. Soon he became a preacher and began attending abolitionist meetings with others who wanted to end slavery in the United States. Before long, he was speaking at anti-slavery meetings himself. In 1845, he published his first autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. It became wildly popular in the United States as well as Europe, selling thousands of copies. Douglas and his friends worried that the fame caused by his book would put him in danger of being recaptured by his old master, and so he traveled to Great Britain for safety. While there, he was a popular speaker. Crowds of people came to listen to him. His supporters there raised enough money to purchase his legal freedom from his old owner at a cost of about $700. With his legal freedom secured, Frederick Douglass returned to the United States in 1847. There, he continued his fight for freedom and equality. He started an abolitionist newspaper, attended women's rights conventions, and called for desegregation of schools. He also helped escaping slaves to freedom on the Underground Railroad. By the time the Civil War began, Frederick Douglass was one of the most famous black men in America. He even served as an advisor to President Abraham Lincoln, calling for equal treatment of black soldiers in the Union Army. Following the end of the Civil War and the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which completely outlawed slavery in the United States, Frederick Douglass continued to call for equality. Black people and women still did not have the right to vote, and states in the South were passing new laws to segregate black people from white people. He lived to see the passage of the 14th Amendment, which made everyone born in the United States a citizen, and the 15th Amendment, which gave former slaves and black men the right to vote. He would not live to see women receive the right to vote, or segregation end. On February 20th, 1895, Frederick Douglass spoke in public for the last time at a women's rights meeting. After returning home, he suffered a heart attack and died. He was about 77 years old. Frederick Douglass remains an influential figure in the history of civil rights in America. He has been honored with statues, and his name is found on bridges and schools across the country. His face has even been put on stamps and coins. He fought all his life for equality for everyone. He always believed what he said in the motto of his newspaper, Right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the Father of us all, and we are all brethren. I hope you enjoyed learning about Frederick Douglass today. Goodbye till next time.
in Congress, July 4, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone, 
for their tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. For protecting them by a mock trial for punishment of any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. For imposing taxes on us without our consent. For depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. For transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which made the fine a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of, and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. <clears throat> we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world, for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be free, and independent states.
Huzzah! Huzzah! That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other thing, acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for, for the, the support, support of this declaration, declaration with, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So as a lot of you know, Frederick Douglass was born into slavery in 1818 in the eastern shore of Maryland. For the first 20 years of his life, he was a slave moving back and forth between the eastern shore and Baltimore. He escaped from slavery in 1838, taking a train from Baltimore while dressed as a sailor, and he eventually made his way to New Bedford, Massachusetts. He worked in the shipyards there and, and as a minister staying relatively quiet about his anti-slavery views, in part because he was still a fugitive slave and was afraid of being remanded back into slavery. But in 1841, he spoke out against slavery at an anti-slavery meeting in Nantucket, Massachusetts, and the great abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison was in attendance. Garrison signed him up on the spot as an anti-slavery speaker with a good salary. And Douglas, with the help of Garrison's anti-slavery organization, moved with his wife and two children to a house in Lynn, Massachusetts. Over the next several years, he emerged as an electrifying anti-slavery speaker for Garrison's Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. Responding to skepticism that someone as eloquent as Douglas couldn't possibly have been a slave, Douglas, in 1845, published what remains his most famous work, his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. This slave narrative or autobiography made Douglass so famous in his own time that he had to flee to Great Britain or otherwise risk being captured as a fugitive slave. While in England, Ireland, and Scotland from 1845 to 1847, Douglas became an international celebrity as an anti-slavery speaker. British supporters bought him out of slavery in 1846, and in 1847, Douglas, now a free man, returned to the United States. But he decided to go to Rochester, New York, instead of back to Massachusetts, because his British supporters had given him money so he could buy a printing press and start up an anti-slavery newspaper, which he called the North Star. He didn't want to stay in Massachusetts and compete directly with Garrison's anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, which up to then was the most widely read anti-slavery newspaper. Rochester would remain Douglas's home base for many years until he relocated to Washington, D.C. around 1870. But to return to 1847, Garrison, a white man, was angry at Douglas for starting up a competing black anti-slavery newspaper, and in 1850, the two men publicly broke with each other. This is significant for the 1852 speech that is the focus of the program today. Garrison argued for nonviolence, or what he called moral suasion, and he believed the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. Thus, he argued that anti-slavery people should not become directly involved in the political system. In 1850, Douglas announced his rejection of Garrison's moral suasion position, arguing that slavery was an act of violence against black people, which, on certain occasions, should be met by violence. He also argued that it's important for free blacks to become involved in the political system. Accordingly, in 1850, he also declared his new belief that the Constitution was in spirit an anti-slavery document. 
In short, in 1850, Douglas emerged as a radical abolitionist. I should add the precipitating Douglas's break with Garrison in the emergence of this new, more aggressive political stance was Congress's passage of the Compromise of 1850, which strengthened the fugitive slave laws that were already on the books. Following the passage of this firmed up fugitive slave law, people in the Northeast, where slavery didn't exist, were nonetheless legally obliged to return fugitive slaves to their masters. From Douglas's point of view, the Compromise of 1850 with its fugitive slave law nationalized slavery and showed the importance of political resistance. For Douglas, the greatest example of political resistance in American history came from the revolutionary fathers and mothers who chose in, 1770, in 1776 to declare their independence from Great Britain and to fight for their independence. That takes us to 1852, the year that Douglas gave what many regard as the greatest anti-slavery speech ever to be delivered in this country, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, an address delivered in Rochester, New York on July 5th, 1852. Douglas was invited to give this July 4th speech by the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, and he delivered it at a large hall in Rochester. Between 500 and 600 people, whites and blacks, paid 12 cents each to hear the speech, which back then I think was significant money. An oratory was public entertainment during the, the pre-Civil War years, and people were willing to pay to hear great speakers. Very importantly, Douglas insisted on giving the speech on July 5th and not July 4th. He felt that until all African Americans were free, he could not celebrate July 4th on the 4th. For those of you who think that this country still has a ways to go to achieve all of the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, which of course begins with the assertion that all men are created equal, it's therefore significant and in the great Douglas tradition that we're, that we're having this event on July 3rd and not July 4th. Just before Douglas gave his July 5th speech, Rochester's Reverend Robert R. Raymond read the complete text of the Declaration of Independence. Then Frederick Douglass walked to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the meaning of July 4th for the Negro, otherwise known as what to the slave, is the 4th of July. Friends and fellow citizens, he who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not ever remember to have appeared before anyone more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my abilities than I do this day. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between the platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. And the difficulties in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today, to me, is a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. With little experience and less learning, I've managed to place my thoughts hastily and imperfectly together, entrusting to your patient and generous indulgence, I shall proceed to lay them before you. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence. It is to you what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to that day and to the act of your great deliverance. May the patriot not hope that high lessons of wisdom, of justice, and of truth shall yet guide her in her destiny. Were America older, the patriot's heart might be sadder. 
the reformer's brow heavier. America's future might be shrouded in gloom, and the hope of her prophets go out in sorrow. There is consolation in the thought that America is young. <laughs> Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask why am I called upon here to speak to you today? What have I or anyone I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? Am I to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude resulting from the blessing of independence to us. Would to God, for both your sakes and ours, an affirmative answer would truthfully be returned to the question, then would my labor be light and my burden easy and delightful? For who would not lend his voice to the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from its limb? But such is not the state of the case. I say with a sad sense of disparity between us, I am not included within the pale of your glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The rich inheritance of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness bequeathed by your forefathers is shared by you, not me. The sunlight that brought life and health to you brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not ours. You may rejoice. We must mourn. And to drag a man in fetters in the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems is inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you intend to mock me, fellow citizens, by calling me here to speak to you today by the rivers of Babylon? Yea, we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps on the willows in the midst thereof. For they who led us away captive required of us a song. And they who wasted us required of us mirth saying sing that song of Zion but how should we sing the Lord's song in a strange land oh Jerusalem if I forget thee may my right hand forget her cunning and if I do not remember thee may my tongue cleave to the root of my mouth fellow citizens beyond your national and tumultuous joy I hear the mournful wailing of millions whose chains, grievous yesterday or today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them, if I do forget, if I do not remember the bleeding children of sorrow. May my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, and to pass lightly over their wrongs, and chime in with the popular theme is treason, most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. The simple story is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. Your fathers deemed the English government as the home government and England as the fatherland. The home government did impose upon its colonial children such burdens and restraints as it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers who had not chimed in with the popular idea of the day of the infallibility of government began to differ with those burdens and restraints. They went so far in their excitement as to pronounce the English government as unruly, unjust, and oppressive, and altogether such as not ought to be quietly submitted to 
And I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. To say now that America was right and England wrong is exceedingly easy. For there was a time when to pronounce against England and in cause of the colonies tried men's souls. Those who did so were called makers of mischief, agitators, rebels, dangerous men. But your fathers were brave men, statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good they did and the cause they stood for, I will stand with you to honor them in their memory. Feeling themselves unjustly treated, they earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and they remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, loyal, and respectful manner. But oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers were wise men, and if they did not grow mad, they grew restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. It was just at this time that the idea of total separation of the colonies from the crown was born, resolved, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between the colonies and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Friends, your fathers made good that resolution. They love their country better than they love their own private interests. They stake their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor all in the cause of liberty. They seized upon eternal principles and set a glorious example in their defense. Mark them, their solid manhood stands out all the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. Shall we take a look at this day? with its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, it is a day that reveals to him more than any other day of the year the gross conduct and cruelty to which he is the constant victim to him, your celebration is a sham. You know what is a swine drover? I'll show you a man drover. They inhabit all of our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation in droves of human stock armed with pistol, whip, and bowie knife, driving a hundred men, women, and children, these wretched souls are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. March the sad procession as they move along, and the savage wretch who drives them. See the old man with locks thin and gray. See the young woman whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun. Her briny tears falls on the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, the young girl of 13, weeping as she thinks of her mother from whom she's been torn. Mark the sad procession. Heat and sorrow nearly consumes their strength. Suddenly, you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank, the chains rattle, your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way into the center of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of a whip. The scream you heard was the mother with the babe in her arms. Her strength had faltered under the weight of the chains and the child and the gash in her shoulder tells her to move on. Follow the procession to New Orleans. Attend an auction there. See 
Men examined like horses. See the frames of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun can you witness such a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? Yet this is but a glimpse of the American slave system as it exists in the ruling part of the United States. But it is just in this moment when I hear someone in my audience say, it is just at this time that you and your fellow abolitionists failed to make a favorable impression upon the public mind. If you would argue more and denounce less, if you would persuade more and rebuke less, your cause might be much more likely to succeed. But I submit where all is plain, there's nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? Am I to argue the point that the slave is a man? The point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. Slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of the laws of their government. They acknowledge it when they punish a slave for disobedience. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia which, if committed by a black man, may subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of those same crimes, if committed by a white man, may subject him to like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? Southern statute books are filled with enactments teaching the slave under severe fines and penalties how to read and to write. When you can point to any such laws as it relates to the beast of the field, then I will consent to argue the manhood of the slave. Americans! Your Republican politics as well as your Republican religion is fragrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love for liberty, your high civilization, your pure Christianity, while all the while the whole political power of the nation conspires to hold in bondage three million of its countrymen. You celebrate fugitives from abroad, you honor them with banquets, you toast them, you salute them, you bless them, but of your own fugitives at home, you advertise, you hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. You mourn fallen hungry. You make her wrongs the subject of your poets, your orators, and your statesmen, but of the ten thousand wrongs committed against the American slave, you enforce the strictest silence and would deem him an enemy of the nation that would make their subject public discourse. You say that all men are created of one blood and that all men everywhere should love one another, yet you notoriously hate those whose skin is not colored like your own. You proclaim before the world, and before the world proclaim, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet, you hold in bondage a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Friends. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism a sham. Your humanity a base pretense. Your Christianity a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the very foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth.